interest of time, we'll get going and people will join us as they can. So I would like to welcome everyone to our uh, Canadian Association of Schools of Nursing Lunch and Learn. And uh, my name is Sandra Davidson and I'm the Dean and Professor at the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Calgary. And I'm happy to welcome you all to our January session, the first of the new year um, for our 2020-2021 Lunch and Learn series. So before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping items. Today's session will be um, we'll begin with our presentation uh, from our speakers and we'll conclude with a 15 to 20 minute Q&A after the formal presentation. And to submit a question, please use the question and answer chat function on your screen. And once you have finished typing your question, just hit the send button so it's not in your little inbox. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the concept of lunch and learn where faculty members come together to dialogue over the lunch hour and share uh, projects and learnings uh, that they're working on and uh, discuss methodologies, successes, challenges, all the rest of it. And this webinar series is intended to serve that as um, that inspiration and net net networking opportunity for participants across the country. Um, and recreating that feel of collegial lunch and learns uh, given the, the COVID situations that we're in. So in this fourth session of our Lunch and Learn series, we will hear from Dr. Jane Tyerman and Dr. Marianne lutkard Flood. And uh, Dr. Jane uh, Tyerman, Tyerman is an assistant professor at the University of Ottawa in Ottawa School of Nursing. And she has over 25 years, years experience, excuse me, in acute care clinical practice and 15 years academic teaching experience, both at the graduate and undergraduate levels. Dr. Tyerman has made significant contributions to nursing education through advancing the pedagogy that underpins the effective use of clinical simulation, as well as through her innovative use of technology to expand equity and access to high quality teaching and learning resources. Dedicated to providing faculty development, supporting simulation based learning, she contributed to the development of the Causen certified uh, Canadian Simulation Nurse Educator Program and instructs course modules focusing on simulation design, evaluation, and scholarship. She was the 2019 recipient of the Cause and Excellence in Nursing Education Non-Tenured Award and in 2020, the Anaxal Spirit of Leadership Award. Dr. Tyerman's research and publication focus on nursing simulation design, development, curriculum implementation, and virtual simulation using serious games. She has had multiple publications related to simulation and virtual simulation games and holds the 2019 Clinical Simulation in Nursing Non-Research Article of the Year. Dr. Tyerman has held various grants exploring virtual impact, excuse me, of virtual serious games in nursing education on student learning related to cost utility. She is currently the co-president of the Canadian Alliance of Nurse Educators Using Simulation or CANSIM. And Dr. Tyerman is known for her dedication, innovations, collaboration and mentorship, encouraging nurse educators to excel in the delivery of simulation based education. Welcome, Jane. And Dr. Marion Lucard Flood is an associate professor at, at Queen's University School of Nursing. She has over 20 years experience as a medical surgical nurse and nurse educator. She has been involved in clinical simulations to, since 2005 and continues to be involved in curriculum development using various simulation strategies. In 2014, she was awarded the Queen's University Faculty of Health Sciences Education Award for Excellence in Innovation and Teaching. And Marion has been an active member of the International uh, Anaxal for time's sake uh, since 2010 and currently serves on the research committee um, editorial board for the uh, journal Clinical Simulation in Nursing. She is co-president um, along with her co-presenter with the, for, the, for CanSim and teaches in the CanSim simulation and virtual simulation game design courses. She is also a certified Canadian simulation nurse educator and teaches in these um, in, in the association uh, sorry, in the simulation certification program. Uh, her program of research initially focused on curriculum development and interprofessional education using simulation. And in 2016, she was the recipient of the Anaxal Excellence in Research Award in recognition of this work. More recently, she was awarded the 2019 Cause and Pat Griffin Nursing Education Research Scholar Award in recognition of her innovation related to the nursing education and virtual simulation in particular. So in today's session, entitled um, 
the development and evaluation of a series of virtual simulation games for nurses and nursing students in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, very timely. Uh, Dr. Tyerman and Dr. Luke Card Flood will review the development and evaluation of a series of COVID-19 virtual simulation games. Um, and educational modules. In response to the pandemic, the Canadian Association of Schools of Nursing and the Canadian Alliance for Nurse Educators um, collaborated um, to basically um, create um, in less than two weeks, uh, virtual simulations to uh, with a cadre of clinical experts to really meet the need around um, COVID-19 assessment and personal protective equipment. And this module was designed to strengthen the capacity of graduating nursing students and practicing nurses to provide care during COVID-19 and the health crisis which it uh, created. To, to the date, the nurse, uh, sorry, the educational modules have been accessed by over 75,000 uh, um, users and um, implemented in nursing programs across the country and indeed globally. So to hear more of this work, I will now turn this session over to our uh, speakers and uh, look forward to your presentation. And again, please type your questions in the, cha in the Q&A chat feature and we'll address those uh, at the completion of the presentation. Over to you. Welcome and thank everyone for joining us today. This is a really relaxed uh, discussion about some uh, of the challenges that we're experiencing and some solutions to these challenges uh, for clinical uh, enhancement, clinical replacement. So we'll be discussing the development of a series of virtual simulation games for nurses and nursing students in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I think you've already heard about us. So um, both Marion and I uh, will be presenting today. And as we said, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat line. As far as disclosures, uh, we are co-presidents of the Canadian Alliance of Nurse Educators Using Simulation, uh, and we're a faculty for the CAUSE and CCSNE program, which I recommend uh, if you're interested in credentialing and simulation. It's a very robust, uh, great program that's um, offered through the year. So we would recommend you uh, look at the CAUSE and website for that in the future. We do have sponsors, Metacore Lab and Spectrum NASCO. So the outline for today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about virtual simulation games and where they came from and how uh, we've used them. We're going to discuss our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We are going to detail the development of the COVID-19 assessment and PPE virtual simulation game that was released in April of last year and then which has merged into this large Health Canada grant uh, where we created a series of games um, for essential skills for nurses and nursing students. So we'll begin by talking a little bit about virtual simulation games in general. So really virtual simulation games are often referred to as serious games and so they're, they're games that are accessed on a computer to, to play a game in which the purpose is education and not simply to entertain. That being said, one of the advantages of a virtual simulation game is that it is entertaining and engaging to the learners. Another thing that I really like about virtual simulation games in comparison to live simulations is that it forces every learner to be put into the decision-making role. So often when we have a large group of learners in a simulation lab, one or two students will take the lead and make the decisions. And the others that are perhaps uh, less, um, less confident will hang back and not make the decisions. But when they're playing a game and they're on their own independently, they, they can make decisions, they can make wrong decisions and learn from them. And they don't have to worry about uh, their peers watching them or their instructor watching them. Some other advantages of virtual simulation games that are that they're accessible as long as you have a, an, an internet connection. They're repeatable, so you might not have time to repeat a live simulation, but students can go back and repeat the game as many times as they want. And at each stage in the game, they get immediate feedback. And similar to live simulation, um, virtual simulation and virtual simulation games have been known to improve knowledge satisfaction and self-efficacy among learners. There's different ways that you can use virtual simulation games. 
when we first started making games, we actually created some short games to use as pre-simulation preparation. And we wanted to engage learners to ensure that they actually came to the live simulation prepared. So these were just uh, short five decision point games. Since then, we've uh, started making longer games that can actually replace a live simulation. So these games might be 10 to 15 decision points. You could also use a game to um, teach about a specific clinical skill. So it could be a psychomotor skill or it could be a soft skill like communication skills. You could bring the game into a classroom setting and perhaps use a classroom response system to have the learners go through the game as a group. And then overall, you can use a, a virtual simulation game to supplement or replace classroom teaching, replace a simulation lab, or even to replace clinical teaching as we found we've had to do during the, the COVID uh, situation. So for us, the issue was that uh, there are some commercial products out there with uh, great virtual simulation games. However, they can be quite expensive and we don't want to uh, extend the cost to the students. And as well, the schools themselves have had faced financial cutbacks. And so we can't really afford to purchase these. If you're going to develop a game using traditional methods, it can be uh, costly and time consuming and requiring IT expertise. And what we did, uh, Jane and I and some colleagues, was to develop a user-friendly, cost-effective method to develop our own virtual simulation games. So the games that we created are based first on learning outcomes. And then we create a video clip of a clinical situation that plays out and then it stops. And the learner is asked a question, a critical thinking question. They have to select one of three potential nursing actions, and then they receive immediate feedback following the selection of an incorrect or correct response. And that's so that even if they're selecting the correct response, we want to make sure that they understand why it's correct and that they're not just guessing. So the first games we developed were through an eCampus Ontario grant. And through this, we, uh, we found that it was both feasible and cost effective for nurse educators like ourselves to develop our own virtual simulation games. We did some usability testing and some evaluation studies. And the games were rated very highly by both educators and students in terms of their usability, their engagement and learning. And they, in a comparison study, they rated the uh, pre-simulation preparation with a game significantly higher than with a case study. Although there are some students that prefer using a case study. Um, this is a paper that we have in press that will be released shortly in the journal Clinical Simulation in, in Nursing. Since we developed the process, we've actually uh, were engaged in traveling across the country, giving workshops and teaching others how to create their own games. And as well, we've had uh, grad students that are doing uh, the same thing, creating games and then doing research around them. And so this is just an example of a game developed by one of my grad students that, and he has had uh, the first paper published and a second paper pending publication. Um, of course, since uh, COVID, we have not been able to travel, but we have been able to uh, deliver virtual simulation game design um, workshops online. And um, so just to tell you a little bit about our website that uh, we have for that houses a lot of our resources, including the virtual simulation games. Um, CanSim, we house all of these on a learning management platform and that's specifically for nurse educators. It is not for students to act. All of our content on the website is downloadable or cut and paste in, so you can put it into your own learning management platform for students to access. So we have all of our VSGs or virtual simulation games housed here and currently we have over 47 games that are available. Um, our mandate is also to have them available in, available in both official languages, French and English. So there's a number of them that are available in French and we're gonna talk about the Health Canada grant, those are all available 
in, in both languages. Um, but we also have recently uh, been awarded some funding to convert the remainder, most of the remainder of our games in both official languages. For our Francophone colleagues that are online, uh, this is uh, something that I think is so important to all of us and so needed. Um, so we have a, over a thousand members, uh, including 400 international nurse educators. So all of our members are nurse educators who are using simulation as part of their uh, courses or within their curriculum. So we're really excited to kind of have such a, a nice, robust membership. So um, next is the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what CANSIM has done to further um, support nurse educators. So first there was an international response um, that also occurred here in Canada. There was a need to move nursing courses online to online formats because students were no longer allowed on campus and they were no longer allowed in clinical uh, settings. Um, two of the major uh, international simulation organizations, Anaxel and SSH, issued a joint statement on the use of virtual simulation during the pandemic. And so they were supporting the use of virtual simulation as a replacement for clinical hours for students currently enrolled in health sciences professions. And they felt that it was critical that the pipeline of educating healthcare professionals remained intact. And based on the current and anticipated shortage of healthcare workers, they propose that regulatory bodies and policymakers demonstrate flexibility by allowing the replacement of clinical hours usually completed in a healthcare setting with that of virtually simulated experiences during the pandemic. And so uh, immediately educators were scrambling to use virtual simulation games to replace live simulations. There were a lot of vendors, commercial vendors that were allowing uh, free open access, access to some of their games uh, during the immediate stages of the, the pandemic, but uh, not, no longer. And then we had a national response. So nurse educators required immediate access to these high quality peer reviewed and contextually relevant simulations and virtual simulations. And the products that are available oftentimes uh, are coming out of the US that uh, don't necessarily follow the same standards that we have in Canada and don't address some of the key issues that are happening um, within our provinces and territories. So we immediately um, responded with our games and resources and provided open access. Uh, we opened our access from April um, until uh, September. So helping everyone, we needed immediate access uh, to get our students through the, the program um, from the last year. So uh, we opened access to that and the message was disseminated by Cousin, um, which led to an eventual partnership between Cousin, CanSim, the Canadian Nursing Association and Health Canada. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about um, access to these resources a little later on in this presentation. So um, once this, uh, you know, the pandemic came about and at the end of middle of March, uh, towards the end of March, uh, both Marion and I were approached by Cousin and asked to make some sort of resource, a virtual simulation games to prepare undergraduate nursing students and practicing nurses in PPE, especially in response to the pandemic. So we created um, a virtual simulation game, COVID-19 assessment and PPE. So to develop this, we needed to make sure that we had a robust team of both uh, content experts and gaming experts. So to ensure the content was relevant to the changing environment, we recorded, uh, recruited a team of public health nurse experts from the Cousin, um, uh, public health interest group and we assembled uh, a guide to go to uh, we assembled the team to guide the content delivery recognition of the urgency and importance of the project all provide all of the individuals involved provided their time and expertise uh, in an in-kind basis we met via video conferencing platform during the last week of March to design the virtual simulation game using the CanSim templates and our process. We shared everything through Google Documents where we could review in real time and edit multiple uh, documents simultaneously. 
So within that one week, we were re able to develop uh, the virtual simulation game, including self-assessment rubrics, uh, decision point maps, the script, the learning outcomes rubric, and reflective questions. So um, I think we did that in about four days, three or four days. So we wanted to know, we had to look at who was our target audience. And so we wanted it nursing students and who are re-entering into the clinical environment. Um, we wanted graduate nursing students because they're gonna be frontline workers. We were gonna target retired nurses uh, in Ontario, Quebec and other provinces. We were recruiting retired nurses to go back into that workforce. So that refresher for PPE was so vital. We wanted it for practicing nurses. Um, there's always some confusion what level of PPE or what specific PPEs are required for um, different procedures. And at the time we were even um, exposed to one of the nurses in one of our provinces refused to do a swab because she didn't have an N95 mask. And so we really wanted to bring up what are the best practice guidelines. And we also wanted our audience to be nurse educators, preparing students to provide care. So one of the great things about this game is um, at the University of Ottawa, all nursing students have to play that game before going into a clinical rotation as a refresher and a reminder. So uh, the design of the game, we used our CanSim process. On day one, we created learning outcomes with related competency indicators. And this is one of the unique things about our virtual simulation games is it's all about self-regulated learning theory that students really have to identify based on learning outcomes, how uh, competent they perceive themselves to be. Um, and that will guide their preparation for the simulation. Um, and we have the related resources there for them. On day two, uh, we used our decision uh, point template and we developed 17 decision points uh, based on the learning outcomes to help to guide the game flow. Each decision point included a critical thinking question that were in alignment with NCLEX type questions. And each question had three responses. So all of our games are based on theory. Uh, so it's cognitive load theory, uh, self-directed learning theory. So we wanted to make sure that uh, we met with the best practices in simulation and, and uh, design. The, of the three responses, one is correct and two are, are either not the best or maybe incorrect. And if they're incorrect, they're common errors that we see in health and care practices. Uh, after uh, you see the video and you make your response and you see the response, the reaction to your response, we also uh, created rationale to outline why the responses were either correct or incorrect. Um, we used uh, guidelines from international sources, uh, such as the World Health Organization, also national sources, such as the Public Health Agency of Canada, along with provincial, regulatory, and institutional guidelines. On day three, uh, we wrote the script on the dialogue between the actors, which detailed filming directions, such as the setting, equipment, props, acting directions, including tone of voice, mood movement, and scene blocking. Um, our VSGs also featured a telehealth encounter with a public health nurse, um, the testing of a COVID-19 assessment center, and assessment in the emergency department. So, um, Drawing on the expertise uh, from the Canadian Public Health Nurses Association, we had all of our uh, resources peer reviewed uh, with content experts, um, including the rubric and the script and our decision point map. Reviewers uh, feedback were then collated, evaluated and the appropriate edits were made. Actors also reviewed the script prior to filming to ensure realism and comfort with the dialogue. And then once the VSG was created, another peer review was conducted by representatives, representatives from the Canadian Nursing Association. So this is a lot of things happened in six days and uh, everyone did it as an in-kind so we were able to create this robust uh, resources from um, the, the support and resources from our peers. 
So then filming, um, this was a, another unique challenge because everybody was on lockdown at the beginning of April. We were uh, allowed to, to teach into the programs. We were um, getting into our labs to film and we need to have that realism. So we were uh, afforded from um, the University of Ottawa gave us special permission to go into the lab and we had to set up safety procedures for everyone involved. We had to have a limited number of of the people, we had to have appropriate PPEs to make sure everyone remains safe. Um, all actors and filming crew wore the PPE, uh, including face masks and use uh, uh, physical distancing. We filmed video clips and we assembled them using the CanSim template, using Articulate Storyline 3 software. And then in compliance with accessibility standards, the VSG was closed caption uh, with screen readers and increased player font size uh, for rewinding content. So that was really an important piece. Um, we filmed using GoPro and iPad and all of these games were filmed from the perspective of the nurse. This is an example of our um, template. So it's a branching template where we have an interim scene of a video clip. And then at, based on that interim scene, there's that critical thinking question. And then there's the three responses. And whatever response you click, uh, click you see the responding action from the, the nurse or the patient so that it will show you why the answer is not necessarily the best response. And then the correct will tell you why it's correct and then move you on to the next interim scene. Hey Jane, just one quick question that fits right here. There's a question from uh, Barb Fagan about what product you use to create the template. We use Articulate Storyline 3, but we actually have a patented template. So you just have to have the software. And then once you um, <clears throat> you work with us, we'll give you everything. So it's, it's really cut and pasted. Um, I am, I'm a nurse educator, I'm an eMERGE nurse, I'm a psychiatric nurse, I am not a gaming expert. So the great thing about this, we had um, uh, e-learning specialist work with us to develop this template and I was the guinea pig for that. So anything that I could do, anything that could go wrong with the template, I did it. And so we were able to modify the template so it's so usable and so um, easy. We have had a number of different universities uh, and nurse educators from these universities uh, use the template and said it was a fantastic, very easy to use. Um, someone at Memorial University, Velda Duke, uh, she just created one last week and had no problem. So um, we just have to show you how to use it uh, so that you don't have to waste time um, learning the way I had to learn. Great, Does thanks. That's that answered the question, great, thank you. So as, as Jane has already mentioned, there were several challenges in rapidly developing this uh, educational module. So the first was the short time timeline. So as there was a need for the resource immediately, we gave ourselves an extremely tight timeline of one week for the project. So the design and filming took under a week, um, but the peer review and edits uh, extended the delivery time to just under two weeks for the English version. And, and unfortunately, several months for the French version as neither Jane nor I are fluently bilingual. Um, we collaborated virtually, which actually worked out quite well. We, we are used to doing this workshop face-to-face, uh, -face, but we were collaborating virtually across multiple time zones. So there were some challenges to scheduling meetings and as well, everybody was working and we're working around uh, different schedules. Um, there were some technical issues for certain participants uh, related to the, the internet access. And then one of the real big challenges was the evolving guidelines. And so we were, there were some inconsistencies between international, national, and, and local guidelines. And they're changing on a daily basis as more information came out about the nature of COVID. So we, we wanted our games to be um, useful in Canada, but and, and elsewhere. And so we had to take all of that into consideration. And of course, there is a disclaimer on, on the game that um, that there can be some variability depending on where you're living or working and depending on what resources you have available to you. And then as uh, Jane mentioned, the COVID-19 restrictions made it difficult for us to do the filming. And uh, that was one of the reasons why we were not able to film in French as well. So instead of filming, 
a separate uh, game in French. What we did was we recorded voiceovers with French actors that were dubbed over the English uh, actor voices in the game. But we also had to translate all of the text into French. Um, so that took some, some time. And so the completed COVID-19 assessment and PPE VSG is housed in the open access uh, forum on the CanSim website at www.can-sim.ca. Uh, this game follows an individual seeking assessment and care of symptoms of COVID-19. As I said, it starts with a, with a public health nurse giving some education, answering questions. Then it goes to a COVID assessment center. What are the PPE required for the patient, the nurse? Um, how do you do an assessment uh, focusing on respiratory and, and the COVID symptoms? We go through um, doing a nasal pharyngeal swab, uh, discharge teaching, then he comes back, his symptoms increase in severity, so he comes to the emergency department. And it really, the focus is on PPE, but there is a lot of assessment, communication, role modeling. And then while he's in the um, in the uh, emergency department in one of the rooms. We even extended about equipment in the room. Can you share equipment from an isolation room um, with others? So these things are relevant to COVID-19, but they will be also relevant after COVID-19. To date, we've had uh, 1.5 million game plays for this game. Um, so it's been a very robust and well-utilized game. I have updated it just last week uh, with the new information about the history and current status of COVID-19 from the World Health Organization. So um, CanSim here offers uh, a number of free resources uh, specific to COVID-19. Um, you can access it by on our website by clicking the, the free resources tab here. We would also recommend that you join CanSim. Um, membership is free if you want to share uh, something in kind and Marion will go through. There's a small monetary uh, fee if you want to become a member for a year or an annual membership just to help sustain our, our program. And then uh, next are the modules. So as I said, uh, we have it as a learning management platform ourselves. Um, and this is specifically for nurse educators uh, to utilize those resources and bring it and merge it into your own learning management platform. The COVID-19 PPE VSG tab takes you to this page. This is an open access learning module with a virtual simulation game related to the um, PPE. Uh, we created in collaboration and then this will also take you to um, all the relevant information uh, related to that specific game. For example, we have a tab that goes through background, learning outcomes, self-assessment rubrics, the game link, virtual debriefing options, reflective questions, and all of the resources that went into creating the game. So if you click on the curriculum tab, it will take you into this uh, resource. First are the learning outcomes. And this is really an important piece because the whole game is based on these learning outcomes. Um, we created the learning outcomes with the public health nurses, and these learning outcomes are also linked with the self-assessment rubric. And here you see the self-assessment rubric. This part is all downloadable. Um, the learning outcomes are cut and paste, so you can bring them into your own platform. And the students here will rate themselves and then make some comments and it'll help to them to guide their learning. And then it'll also show them, we have them use this rubric again at the end of the virtual simulation to see their areas of improvement and still some areas that they wanna focus on. So we explain how you can use this uh, rubric um, in your own program. Next is the game link. We talk about how you can, uh, how the game best works in Chrome or Firefox, you click right there, it will open up a new page and that's where your URL and the actual game is. So you just cut and paste the URL and you will, um, your students will have access. This is an example of the COVID-19. We've got a video clip, we followed by a, a decision question, a critical thinking decision question, the video and the rationale pieces for that. Um, we really focused on some key things on, you know, PPE application, how to apply a mask, um, 
other PPEs that are required, how to do that nasal pharyngeal swab. And we actually have skills that we role model how uh, the appropriate steps should be um, adhered to. So we, we haven't had a chance to do a formal evaluation yet, but that is coming. Um, however, we have been receiving a lot of um, anecdotal feedback from users, students, educators, and nurses. And so we've received emails as well as posts on our website. And generally, the comments are very, um, very positive. And so it really speaks to the fact that this uh, resource was uh, very much needed. And Jane mentioned already that our this particular game has been accessed one, over 1.5 million times worldwide. Um, another thing that has helped is that the game has been endorsed by organizations such as COSIN, CNA, and Axel SSH, Simulation Canada, and the NLN. And so this really, again, uh, signifies how much uh, this resource was needed. You'll see that our bandwidth has been increasingly uh, used, and so this was the one of the reasons for instituting a small fee for CanSim resources if you're not able to share something uh, with our repository. So after we created the first game, uh, Dr. Cynthia Baker and Jane and I applied to Health Canada for a grant to help support the development of further VSG. So the first game was all done uh, pro bono, but we felt that if we were going to create more games that we needed some funding to support that. And so we collaborated with uh, Kazan once again, and we were uh, successful in obtaining the grant. And Simulation Canada was a partner that was involved in helping with the dissemination of the final product. So it was really important once again to involve frontline nurses. And so we invited nurses from across Canada to create the, the virtual simulation games to ensure there was authenticity with what was happening in the field. And so we recruited from the CASN interest groups as well as CANSIM. When you join as a member, we ask you about your research interests and your clinical interests. And so I just went right through that list and invited people uh, who had clinical expertise in emergency or critical care nursing and uh, so it was really nice uh, way to quickly identify uh, individuals that could help us uh, with our games and so we created five separate writing teams and uh, Jane and I led each of these teams through the uh, writing process so we just like to acknowledge the content experts were those that helped us to write the games and then we had a number of peer reviewers give us feedback after we had written the scripts uh, to ensure that uh, things were accurate across Canada and that they were uh, relevant to to all nurse nurses and nurse educators. So again, we had a tight timeline. We had two weeks of intensive writing sessions. So Jane and I were on Zoom all day long, every day, writing these five games and trying not to get them mixed up. Um, we filmed the five uh, games in English in July and August, um, partly at Queens and partly at Ottawa U with special permission, wearing PPE in August in the lab that <laughs> was, was, was very, uh, very hot. Um, we were able to get the English games completed by September and they underwent further peer review and were uh, finally posted in October. We, we knew we couldn't refilm them in, in French. Um, so again, we used French actors to uh, record the voiceovers, but of course we had to have all of the scripts translated prior to that happening. And so the French VSGs are now completed and uh, Jane was up half the night working on those and they, they will be posted probably officially by next week, I think. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so you'll be able to use those in either official language. And so one thing I should say, uh, Ottawa U and also Algonquin College uh, in Ottawa also. You're right, yeah. Fantastic simulation center and they also supported the, the filming of these games. We had so, a trouble getting a ventilator because all the schools had, had donated their ventilators back to the hospital. So that was one of the challenges. Yeah, big challenges. So uh, we have a specific site dedicated open access to these games because it was through a grant. So, so far we have these five new games along with the uh, COVID-19 assessment and PPE. So if you want to access these five games, they're found at www.cansim.ca 
uh, slash HC. And they, um, so the first game was uh, the patient Robert Karen. And so we decided to continue with Robert Karen. So he was at the COVID assessment center and the emergency department. The deteriorating patient uh, respiratory deterioration is Robert Karen in the hospital on a med surge unit. Then we have the care of a ventilated patient. It's Robert Karen now ventilated. So we try to have an unfolding case. We also added to that the geriatric fluid volume deficit, uh, fluid and electrolytes um, uh, were involved in that because we know that students struggle with electrolytes. We also uh, did a multiple organ dysfunction game uh, with an intubated patient and running a code. So the modifications with COVID-19 and running a code, and they were all uh, based on the Canadian uh, Heart and Stroke Foundation's guidelines. So each game has its own uh, page. And within that, similar to the other learning management platform, we have the background, the learning outcome, self-assessment rubric, game link, virtual debriefing, resources and uh, uh, reflective questions. So you just click on the top. You can see I clicked on the top here. It was background and the next one is the learning outcome. So again, cut and pasteable or downloadable. Um, so specific to the games, so the geriatric fluid volume, you can see images for both the English and the French game. Uh, the learning outcomes is really to communicate uh, relevant priority information, to perform comprehensive assessments, to recognize early signs and symptoms and complications of fluid volume imbalances, to select and don and doff PPE appropriately according to public health measures and communicate to the patient using therapeutic principles. So those are really relevant contextually bound um, uh, content that guide the delivery of that one. The next one is, uh, as I said, Robert Karen deteriorating. And this one really, I, one thing that uh, both Marion and I noticed is that students struggle with oxygenation. And so they everything can be solved with two liters of nasal prongs. Um, so what we decided to do is to go through every oxygen appliance that we could find um, and appropriately apply it based on his symptoms. So we have a meter dose inhaler uh, with instructions. We have a nasal prongs. We have a simple mask. We have a venti mask. We have a non rebreather. We have an airvo. All the way up to intubation. So we wanted to conduct a focused respiratory assessment. We wanted to communicate priority information. We had to anticipate modifications for care for a patient suspected of COVID-19. We wanted to determine, is the next, previous slide, Mary, uh, determine appropriate PPE, communicate therapeutically, and perform clinical interventions. Sorry, so now we're on. So then he now goes and he's intubated. And so understands infectious diseases transmission, identify the need for and performs endotracheal suctioning, adheres to practice interventions for a patient in prone position, because prone position is like one of the key uh, interventions to support patients in ARDS and with COVID-19. Um, conduct a nursing assessment for the intubated patient, communicate essential information to the healthcare team and evaluate potential causes of vent alarm. So this is so relevant to our nurses as they're moving into those critical care areas. The, la the next one is a, um, a multiple organ dysfunction. So conduct uh, communicates with team members, comprehensive assessments, critical interventions in response to assessment findings and modifications to care. And then the next one was uh, running a code or a code blue, uh, establish cardiac arrest, uh, utilize PPE, implement appropriate algorithms and modifications for COVID-19 patients, collaborate with team members to prioritize intubation, uh, intubation and communicate uh, effectively with team. And so those are all uh, team dynamics. And we have filmed and put together the English, and I'm just putting together the French one now. Uh, this is suicidal ideation assessment of risk, and that's a new one coming out. And it's an international uh, nursing student who calls the University Health Center to talk to the nurse. And it really is an assessment of uh, suicidal ideation and risk and uh, works with the student there. So we've, we've talked a lot about CanSim resources that are available. Um, so all of the Health Canada resources are available open access. We also have the, the CanSim repository of scenarios and VSGs that are, they were set up to be shared amongst contributing members. So if you, if you made a game or a scenario and, and, uh, 
and shared it with us and with the, the CANSEM community, then you would have access to all of the uh, resources. And so um, what we were finding, however, with um, COVID, so we, we initially had open access for everybody, um, but there was an overwhelming number of new members that wanted access to the VSGs and that, that didn't have a resource to share. And so we, we, we had to increase our bandwidth at least twice and our time and everything. So what we decided was that we would introduce uh, a paid membership of $50 annually, which is a small, a small fee that would give um, the members access to all of the resources, even if they couldn't contribute something. And we did set up a lifetime membership as well. And so our membership has grown uh, and, and I can't even keep up with all the requests. Um, so if you do submit a request, uh, it might take a few weeks for me to get back to you. Um, although I do tr tend to activate the, um, the paid ones first because um, you know they're 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 paying money, so we want to make sure that they get get activated. And so one of the things that we're planning to do with the money is to uh, set up a CanSim nursing simulation uh, innovation grants. And um, once January is over, we will have time to work on the um, on on the call for for abstracts for that because we really want to support. Uh, nursing innovation and research related to simulation in Canada. And so look forward to that. And uh, please consider joining us at our collaborative group of nurse educators. And uh, we look forward to sharing our knowledge and expertise and our design and everything with you if you're interested. And that's uh, just to confirm, that's $50 for an educator. So the nurse educators, once you have it, then you give it to the student, you cut and paste it. To, so you can have hundreds of students. Um, you know, the other pro other resources out there, such as vSIM is $175 per student per semester. This is just $50 for a year. And then you can have access to all of our resources. And then you can then transfer them to your learning man management platform. The reason why we don't want students to have the access to the whole site is because they'll be like, oh, I want to play this mental health game. And oh, this looks like another interesting game. And then Marion may be teaching that mental health course and she'll want to bring it into their program. And the students were like, I already did it. And another option is, another reason why is these games have to have some sort of debrief. Um, and we guide you through that virtual debrief option so you can pick and choose which ones are appro uh, most appropriate because we need to maintain uh, uh, the standards of best practice, but we also need to maintain psychological safety. And, and these games need to be debriefed with a, uh, an educator afterwards. So that's, those are the, the priority reasons why they're not open to students, just to educators. So uh, we would like to open it up to any questions. Great, thanks to both of you for a, a very informative and, and intriguing um, presentation. And uh, just wanna say my sincere thanks on behalf of all of the, the nurses and nurse educators across the country in developing these resources so quickly. Um, just can't thank you enough, um, real great service. A uh, couple of questions that have come in so far. Um, Lori says, I see the topics of the um, VSGs on the website. If the topic that we need, and she's saying something like leadership and management nursing is not listed, do you recommend that we design it um, by attending one of the design webinars? Great question. Um, I'm actually in the process after January, <laughs> after I get all these French games done. Um, I think I'm going to reorganize because we've exploded. We tried to add at least three to five games per month that Marion and I um, create or co-create. Uh, and so I think I'm because there's so many of them now, I'm going to separate them into areas of specialty, such as leadership. Uh, we do have a, a game in leadership on there, uh, conflict resolution. But if you're interested in creating a game, um, we have access to resources. So we run workshops uh, at cost. So we run those pretty much every month. And so in our workshop, we usually create with you two games. So we start from the very beginning to the end in four days, we'll create a game and you'll have access to that. Uh, the participants guide the content. So if you wanted to do a leadership one, we'll do one with you. And then it will enable you then to use our template, use our resources to create your own. Our only requirement is that the template, it's uh, owned by Cansim. So whatever you make, you have to share it 
with CanSim members. So as a member, you get the resources from everybody else's content, and then you can share yours. So it's, it's really about not working in silos. It's sharing your expertise, sharing your resources to support highest quality of the delivery of nursing education, especially in terms of simulation-based education. So uh, join one of our workshops uh, and then you'll have access to all of that. Because mm -hmm. it's too hard to do it without having that guidance yeah. uh, to go through the process. Because again, it's all based on theory. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. And just to go back, I think you've answered the question. Barb had a follow-up question about the template, which I think you've answered. Um, and then um, once you once people take that design course, is the intent then that they can use once they've been through that initial design process, they can go forth and, and create more because they have that foundational knowledge. Yep. Just in the past month, um, Memorial University has created and will be sharing um, a pediatric RSV game. Uh, Camosun College it has created another virtual simulation game and we have a number of other universities, uh, including Durham College that um, are working on games. The problem right now is getting access into our labs to film. So we do have a number of games. We have a focus on NPs. Uh, so there's an NP series coming. There's a mental health series coming. Um, there's a wound care series coming that we're in the process of developing. Any other ones I'm missing, Mary? There's a medication calculation series. And then there's also resources to support faculty. So we created, um, so a lot of clinical instructors are required to engage in virtual simulation. And so, as I said, that virtual debriefing is essential. That's where some of the most robust learning takes place. And to conduct a debriefing, it's not something that people intuitively know how to do. There's lots of models out there. So we created a two hour faculty development module that goes through what is uh, debriefing, what is virtual debriefing. We use the model of debriefing for meaningful learning. Then we show you a debriefing of that COVID-19 game using the DML and then giving you resources to how to structure your debrief. So that gives you a certificate at the end. So that's really good for faculty development. We have how to fail a student in clinical game. So we're building a repository also for clinical instructor resources. Um, so those, those will be coming up shortly. And, and we, we usually film in the lab using a GoPro camera, but what we've been doing during COVID is we've done a lot of uh, games using Zoom, using this telehealth um, double screen type of games, and, and they're very effective as well. Um, mm -hmm. So um, it looks like from the chat that you're, there's a number of people that are joining now because they're just uh, so excited to be a part of all this. So that's great. And, and lots of kudos for your amazing work, uh, Marianne and Jane. Uh, one of the questions that I had just in terms of, you know, the, a lot of this was the COVID-19 response and now we're moving into the vaccines available and, and moving into, you know, vaccine confidence and combating, he combating hesitancy. Any opportunity or plans in the works to develop a virtual simulation around how to hold a conversation for a patient that may be hesitant about accepting the vaccine? Has that been, come on your radar? Yes. That's already done. So we, um, our last workshop, we wanted to do the vaccine hesitancy for COVID. The problem is when we went into, we want to make sure it's high quality. And if you go in anywhere, you'll see it's safe. It's great. There's no problems, but we don't know enough about it. So we collaborated with content, uh, with experts and they suggested uh, at this point in time, it's probably not a good idea to do that. So we created a vaccine he hesitancy game on HPV. So right. it follows those same discussions with the, um, well, it's actually with a 14 year old. So it's a, a mature minor consent. Um, but we actually did all the communication so it can be easily transferred to the right. vaccine for COVID. It's just, we don't know enough. And I don't want to sit there and say, you know, can some projecting this vaccine is perfect and da, 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 when we when we are just evolving and I'm sure it is, but we want to make sure that we have the most current relevant information. 
That's, and I think that's a great strategy around how to have a conversation around vaccine hesitancy generally and the principles of how to hold that conversation. I think that's great. And there's another comment here just around um, a vaccine reaction would be another opportunity for you know identifying and responding to a, somebody who's having a vaccine um, yeah. reaction. So maybe now that we have more information, we, we could do something like that. Yeah, and it's really important that all of our games, like these games that we just did with Causin and Health Canada, they're, you know, uh, ventilated patient mods, all of those things are specific to COVID, but they are also going to be transferable outside of COVID when the patient has um, infectious disease and that. The only one that's a little bit different is running a code. Um, it follows uh, with each, we have a number of cardiac arrest scenarios. We have a B, uh, asystole, V-fib, uh, I think we have VTAC without a pulse, and this one is a PEA arrest. So we try to, to change the rhythm so that we can go through the different algorithms. So all of that content, there's just a few little things like early intubation, which we do now with COVID-19, which we don't necessarily do when we're not in the pandemic. There's a couple of modifications, but it's really important that all these games will be transferable into the future. So we tried to level them up. There's a, our games uh, start from a very beginning nursing student all the way up to <clears throat> our consolidating students and newly practicing nurses. The ventilator one, in case people are thinking, oh, that's too advanced for our students. It's what you would see outside of an ICU. So I work in Emerge and we have a, a vented patient as quickly as we can get them out, we do. So one of the things is the vent alarms. And one of the things I see in practice is the alarms going, first thing we do is silence it without necessarily understanding why. So we say it's a high pressure, we show them how to suction. So there's skills, we show them how to do skills. We show them how to do assessments uh, using tools. So assessing for pain for an unresponsive patient and we go through special tools fluid and electrolytes. And again, as I said, our questions are based on NCLEX. So we have multiple choice, we have multiple select, we have drag and drop, we have hot spots. So we try to incorporate these different types of testing questions that they're going to see in NCLEX, mm -hmm. um, which is really an important piece too. Great. I just wanted to point out, we have one other open access resource available, the SOGI nursing website, and I've put it in the, the chat box. That is the sexual orientation and gender identity nursing uh, website. And it has an embedded course with four virtual simulation games. Um, it's about cultural humility. And so this is something uh, that everybody needs information about and uh, it's open access. So you can, you can use that right away. Awesome, that's great. Um, thanks for that. And just a, another question while we're waiting for others to, to formulate um, their own questions. What about, uh, you know, are, are the modules available or do they adapt to interprofessional practice? So if I was a pharmacist and I wanted to go through a simulation that I see on your website, what, what has been the uptake there of other profession, health professions wanting access and just your thoughts about that? So we, a lot of our games are interprofessional, right? So we wouldn't say that the nurses would run everything in these situations. So the COVID-19 games have physicians, respiratory therapists, nurses, RPNs, UAPs. So we incorporate all of that. And we use the word UAP consistent with NCLEX. Right. Um, we do have other specialties using our games. One of the great uptake at Ottawa U is uh, our Dean of Health Science has requested uh, that the programs that are having students in clinical practice use the assessment and PPE uh, game before uh, entering into clinical practice as a refresher. So that's always uh, great. And as we move forward, like we're using NPs, uh, lots of specialties. So we have uh, Dr. Kevin Wu, who's a wound specialist. So we have him guiding uh, a lot of our wound care series games. And the great thing about this too is we are nurse educators, but we're also 